Today is Thursday, July 24th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I'm in Stillwater to interview Harold Sanders and discuss his life experiences including his service in the United States military. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project. Mr. Sanders, thank you for joining us today. Pardon? Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's begin with uh, where you were born, when, and, and what it was like growing up there. I was born March the 8th, 1927, in St. Joseph, Missouri. Uh, what was it like? Hot and cold. <laughs> uh, my father always planted uh, two uh, a garden that was two city lots wide, and um, one of those lots was always potato patch, hmm. and uh, so I had the pleasure of planting a lot and picking up a lot. Hmm. Uh, most of the time, it was very I had a very pleasant life and enjoyable. And you grew up during the Great Depression. Tell me what that was like. Well, I was fortunate in that my father always had a job that paid fairly well. Mm -hmm. And where most, many people were living on a dollar a day. Uh, uh, we were make my dad was making thirty-five, forty dollars a week. So we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. Absolutely. And do you have many siblings? Yeah. Sibling. A sister. One sister? One sister, older than I am. And she's 91 years old now. And did you do the majority of the work on the farm? It wasn't a farm. I mean, on the garden? On the garden. Oh, no. My dad did most of it. What was it like going to school during that time? It was very, very pleasant. Um, I don't know how to explain that. Did you, did you walk to school? Oh yes. I only had about a mile and a half to walk <laughs> over a hill. <laughs> and was that a one-room schoolhouse? Oh no. My elementary was a two-story. Oh. Uh, brick building. My uh, high school, I went one year in an old school on top of the hill and then they built a new one down below and I finished my high school there. So would you say that you grew up in a town life or a country life? Oh, definitely a town life. Okay. City life. Okay. And did you work your way through high school? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, at age 13, I took a job as soda jerk delivery boy at a drugstore. Hmm. And at 15, during the war, I took a job as a uh, butcher in a slaughterhouse uh, cutting up pork chops. Hmm. <laughs> Were you involved in activities like the Boy Scouts or anything like that? I was definitely in the Boy Scouts and for about five years and um, Sons of the American Legion, I was very active in it and basically that's it. Do you have a, a family history of military service? My dad was in the uh, First World War. Okay. And uh, do, do you recall December 7th, 1941? Do you remember that day at all? Or were you too young? I guess you oh, I definitely remember. Uh, we just came home from church and I went to over to this drugstore I worked at and was standing there reading comic books. <laughs> Uh, when the radio announced about Pearl Harbor. Hmm. That, that gives me an interesting question. Uh, did you 
Were, well, first, were you into a lot of comic books during that time? Did you read a lot of comics? I read a lot of comic books. How did the comics change throughout the course of the war? Did you notice anything, Captain America, or anything like that? Well, you you got your Superman and, and Wonder Woman, and those came in. Okay. Uh, I didn't. I didn't really notice. And uh, going to high school, uh, were you considering going to World War II after high school? What were your plans? Well, my, uh, December of... 41? No, oh. 44. December 44, I needed a quarter of a credit to graduate. Huh. And I went in the Navy. I got in the Navy. And because I went in the service during the war, they gave me my quarter credit. Mm -hmm. So my girlfriend got my uh, my uh, annual, 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 and took it around to everybody to sign it. And I think my parents went across the stage for me. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. So, were you 17 whenever you enlisted? Not 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where did you go to basic training? Great Lakes Naval Station. Tell me a little bit about the training. <laughs> well, it wasn't all pleasant. Basically, we, we had a company commander, chief petty officer, as an alcoholic. Mm. And so they punish him, we got all kinds of work weeks. Hmm. And uh, a lot of our training went by the wayside. But uh, we had, I always ended up getting a good, good job on it. <laughs> and uh, well, that, that was basically my, my problem with basic. Did you make any friends with your the people in basic training that you not, kept up with? Not that I uh, kept up with. Mm. And you mentioned a girlfriend in high school. Did you maintain communication with her? No. Mm. Uh, I had broke up with her. Oh. Okay. But she still went and did these things for me. That was nice of her. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about how you uh, stayed in contact with your family. Yeah, what? Just sent them letters. Okay. All I can, all there was. <laughs> <laughs> so after your basic training, uh, where did you go from there? I went to San Diego. We transferred out to the Pacific and uh, put on a troop ship. Uh, it was 5,000 uh, Army, Navy, Marines. Um, and as, as I, after we got over there to a big island called Mog Mog, <laughs> uh, we were, I was set off, the, off of the uh, transport into a repair ship, middle of the night. Everything happened middle of the night. Hmm. And <clears throat> there the <clears throat> the captain, first thing, wanted to show his authority. So in the Navy you have a seaman and you have firemen. Mm -hmm. And the firemen basically work below deck. The seamen work above deck. Mm -hmm. So he took, he said, I want all you seamen over here on the port side all you firemen over here on the starboard side. You firemen are now seamen. You seamen are now firemen. <laughs> Didn't make any difference what our aptitude was, what the Navy decided we should be. Hmm. He showed his authority. Huh. So uh, which side did you end up on? I ended up as a seaman. Had a very rough job. They put me in communications in 
as a radio man. I knew nothing about radios, still don't. Mm. But uh, they put me in the emergency radio shack. And first thing, second class petty officer asked me if I knew how to make coffee. Well, I don't want to show my ignorance. I never made a pot of coffee in my life. <laughs> But I remembered somewhere having heard Paul Harvey on the radio say that you make a cup of coffee, make a pot of coffee, one spoonful of grounds per cup and one for the pot. Well, I didn't know if that was one for the, each cup for the pot. So that 10 cup pot got 20. Spoons of coffee ground. Well, if you, you've never been in the military, enlisted men never saw a teaspoon. All we ever had was tablespoons. Mm. So, the spoonfuls of coffee were tablespoons. <laughs> well, when it got finished, I was elected the official coffee maker. And I had the pleasure of going to commissary and picking up two pounds of coffee every day, because huh. that's how much I, I made. So everyone was all hyped up on caffeine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could say. You know, you could pour it almost. <laughs> but, well, go ahead. What other food and drink did you have while you were in, in the Navy on the ships? What? What other food and drink did you have? Well, this ship, Ben's a, it was a repair ship, stayed back away from most of combat. Mm -hmm. And every day, Ben's, I, my work schedule was all around nothing. I got to go over on the beach, along with his anchorage, mm -hmm. and have, have two cans of beer. <laughs> and swim and just play around. Hot beer, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty warm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, But the food was good. Hmm. So you got to try some uh, of the local food? Oh, no. Oh. No. Um, this last year, there was a typhoon hit a uh, little town in the Philippines called Tacloban. Mm -hmm. Well, according to the pictures, it has grown considerably. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I was there, there was a little one house and a school. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the village, I don't know where it was, I never saw it. But uh, according to the news, it had grown considerably. But the name of the town I was at was uh, Tacloban. Did you ever interact with civilians? Not there. Mm -hmm. uh, never saw any. Hmm. But the uh, my job at besides making coffee <laughs> was I was supposed to proofread the uh, mimograph sheets. That's a second class petty officer typed of the news for the day. Mm -hmm. And I put them on mimograph paper. And then I had the job of running a mimograph machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was generally four or five pages, maybe six pages long. A lot of hand turning. Mm -hmm. but then I had the pleasure of delivering. And I'd go into the officer's ward room, of course it's all in bed, this, this middle of the night, and fill my shirt up with their fruit they had left on their table. Then I'd go down to the warrant officer's ward room, do the same thing. Chief Petty Officer and do the same thing. I always took the baker a paper too. I always got a pie. Uh, Go to the butcher shop and I generally get a ham sandwich. <laughs> and I had a lot of fun. And then I took all this 
food down to where I worked huh. and uh, put it in a drawer and everybody ate it. <laughs> oh. You didn't try to make any money off of it? No. Nope. <laughs> I hear a lot of stories about uh, gambling in the Navy during World War II. Did you guys play cards or anything? I don't believe I played a game of cards uh, while well, I was there. How did you guys pass the time whenever you weren't busy? Well, writing letters. <laughs> oh, yeah. How long would it usually take to get a letter back? Oh, uh, I never stopped to think about that. Huh. But it wasn't very fast. <laughs> uh, to back up a little bit, how did you prepare yourself before you deployed to the Pacific Theater? Uh, did you talk with family, friends? Uh, how did you prepare yourself mentally for going to, to war? Well, I never really thought about it. Really? When I joined, I joined. <laughs> Interesting. And you volunteered because you were 17. Yeah. Uh, what led you to volunteer? Well, I didn't want to be in the Army. <laughs> and I didn't like the idea of sleeping in the mud. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I'd take the Navy. Okay. So. All right. so tell me about some of the locations that you went to. You, you mentioned well, the Marshall Hawk Islands. Hawk Island. And then I went to Lady Gulf and uh, spent several months there. Then we went to Okinawa, to Buckner Bay, and uh, stayed there for, well, besides going out for the ty a typhoon, uh, we stayed there for probably, probably three months. Mm. And it's your time on Leyte. Did you go on the island? Went on the island uh, to have my beer. <laughs> Couldn't drink on ship. Okay. Not supposedly. Oh, yeah. And uh, were the visible signs of combat still? Well, in that particular area hadn't been tore up. But there was a Catalina bomber. Uh, that had crashed was on the, on the beach. Huh. And you've been there, I don't know, who knows how long. <laughs> Interesting. And what about in Okinawa? Did you... On Oki, I had the pleasure to go and have my beer. <laughs> then I'd go wander. Sometimes by myself. And sometimes with two or three or four of the guys. We always got into things. Uh, one day I found a crate that looked like a lettuce crate. Huh. And young kid. So I opened it up and started looking at it and there was tubes that was wrapped up in paper and had pictures on them. Hmm. And uh, so I just took part. They were type of a, uh, a mortar, I think. Mm. Uh, it has a spike that came down, you stick in the ground, take a uh, match head that was in the bottom disc of the of it, and scratch this uh, silver tip that was sticking out, mm. and poof. And it was a Japanese mortar round? Yeah. Okay. And some of them exploded, some of them didn't. Some of them let out smoke. So you fired them off? I fired them off, oh yeah. <laughs> Last time I set five of them up and then left. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, then we, one time we found uh, caves, Japanese and Jews, and one of them was ammunition. And we found a case of black powder, 
So we had to take some of that out and see what happened. Put it on a rock. This one guy said, I'll strike a match to it. Well, he was on the wrong side. He got black because the, when the black powder ignited, it went all over him. <laughs> <laughs> and did you keep any souvenirs that you may have discovered on these journeys? Yeah. I had, I found a Japanese 20 millimeter shell that had never been fired. And one of the times in our walking around, we found an ammo dump. And there's four of us, just happened to be four pineapple hanger grenades laying on the ground. Hmm. So we each took one. And going walking down the road, I said, I wonder what. And I unscrewed the top, poured the powder out, put it back together, and pulled the pin and threw it. <laughs> pop! Yeah, you know, just a little pop. Yeah. And uh, so I saved it. Huh. And I had fun with it. I would walk up to somebody and say, Hey, have you met my new friend? Pull the pin and hand it to him. <laughs> <laughs> I was an honor cuss. <laughs> Let's see. But one day, Chief Warrant Officer walked in on me, and I had him sitting on a table. <clears throat> he stepped back out the door, and I had to report to him. I was informed I would get rid of him. Mm. Well, I didn't. But anyway, I had had him here for, for a long time. At, at the house for a long time, and when they made me a munitions person, there had been discussion about people stealing mm. uh, munitions, and uh, I decided it'd be better just to get rid of them. Oh, I see. Uh, in case there, there would, shouldn't have been any problem, but anyway, mm. I didn't know, so I crashed them. <laughs> and. In Okinawa, were there civilians on, left on the island? There were, but I couldn't find any villages hmm. where, I, where we was walking. And uh, except one time, <coughs> we were, there was three of us walking down this road, following an ox cart. Hmm. We wanted to see a village. And I happened to look up ahead and saw a guard post up ahead. And I said, I think we need to go the other way. Oh, yeah. So we turned around and go the other way. And heard somebody holler, halt. We didn't. I heard some bolts click. I said, I think we'd better stop. <laughs> and if we hadn't, they would shot us. Yeah. And it was open open season on anybody walking around out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, turns out that the village we was going to go into was a leper colony. Wow. And if we had gotten in, they'd put us there. <laughs> so, so you never went to the village, but did you see people walking across no. the island? No. No. Interesting. Uh, I never saw any of the islanders except this one hmm. with that ox cart. Interesting. Um, I did find a, a house had been pretty well destroyed uh, one day and picked up a, a uh, sake cup, cup. Hmm. and uh, I brought it home. But that's, I, uh, I got transferred after the war, was completely over and everything. I was transferred off of that repair ship huh. onto a merchant ship that took me to Osaka, Japan. No, Yakuska, Japan. And at Yakuska, they put me on destroyer escort. And, uh, Funny thing, we were talking about drinking a while ago. New Year's Day, not New Year's Eve, 
of 46. The, uh, uh, there was a bunch of drunks. <laughs> That's the way I could describe it. Found out that every lifeboat and life raft on that ship didn't have a drop of water on them. Had nothing but raisin jack. And they decided they was going to celebrate. <laughs> so the captain and everybody huh. got involved in a big party. And uh, <laughs> coming back from Japan, the captain decided we needed some recreation. So I stopped Stop the destroyer escort in the middle of the Pacific. Just go swimming. <laughs> so we all went swimming. Uh -huh. And some of the guys started climbing the mass, going to jump off the yard arms. And he stopped that. Oh, yeah. And that was a little dangerous. <laughs> of course, we had a boat out there going back and forth with riflemen on it to shoot any sharks. <laughs> <laughs> But I never saw any. Where were you when the war ended? I was in the Philippines. And uh, did and Doolittle had left from the Philippines. I, I believe so. No. Uh, no. No. Doolittle went off of an aircraft carrier. Okay. Okay. And uh, he and his other pilots took. They had special training to take a. B-24 mm. off of an aircraft carrier. Oh yeah, I'm thinking the wrong guy. I'm sorry. Um, whenever they dropped atomic bombs, mm -hmm. they, they left from that area. Um, no. Uh, the atomic bomb, if I remember right, was, was blown out of uh, Saipan. Okay. If I remember right. And uh Yeah. What were your impressions? When did you hear first when did you hear of the use of the atomic bomb? Well, that day. That day. And what were your impressions initially? You know, I don't I don't think I thought about it. I just, we received one time, we received a note, a note on the radio from Tokyo Roads hmm. while we was in the Philippines. Wow. Telling us what anchorage we were at and all about it and that uh, they were going to come visit us that night. And uh, they tried, but the Marine Corps Air Force stopped. Wow. And they didn't get to us. Was there ever a fear of kamikazes? I never saw anything like that, no. Because, yeah, almost that, that would have been out where the uh, major fighting was. Mm -hmm. okay. And so whenever you went on the mainland of Japan, what did you think about it? What did you think about the culture of Japan? I enjoyed it. It was it was different. Um, New Year's Day, I was ashore at Osaka, and I almost went into a movie house that they were showing Gone with the Wind, <laughs> and I had never seen. It. Then I got thinking about it. Now we just beat these people, and you're going into a dark movie house with a bunch of them. I think you better think about it. Huh. So I didn't. Then I I had wanted to get my picture painted on a silk handkerchief for my mother. And uh, I stopped at this place to do it and they had two Marines there that was getting their done. And they didn't have any use for those Marines. And when the Marines left, I told them what I wanted. Okay, sit down here. And they got a hibachi 
and sat between my legs for my hands to out over it to keep my hands warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was quite cool. And I had a cute little girl hold my hands too. <laughs> but uh, it was entirely different with me as the Navy as they were treating the Marines. Interesting. <laughs> so do you ever feel any tension between yourself and the locals? No. Uh, okay. I wasn't. Uh, that was the only time I was ashore in Japan. Okay. Yeah. So after you left Japan and you were going home, where did you where did you go from that? Take us back to the states. Back to San Diego. Okay. What was the atmosphere like in San Diego after the war? Well. I went to a church there and got with the youth group, and it was very pleasant. Um, they were very cordial, and the people uh, accepted, military people. Um, some place I was at at different times, or it was a little bit, uh, it wouldn't have anything to do with it. During the World War II era? Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. And uh, it's like they've told me at, uh, oh, darn it, in Kansas, Fort Riley, and at the town right next to it, and I can't think of the name of it. But anyway, they used to have signs in their front yard dogs and sail, uh, soldiers keep out. Ticked off the soldiers got to put the dogs first. They they weren't, people wouldn't have anything to do with them. Now, what was the cause of that, do you think? Uh, was it the reputation that the Navy had for going well, this to this was Zen? Army. Oh, Army, okay. That would been Army people, but... Uh, the people just didn't have any use for them. Huh. Uh, they didn't want to associate with them. Interesting. What were your plans um, after the war? Well, I just went home, went to work in the slaughterhouse, and uh, decided I wanted to go into the railroad business. Um, I went to business school to learn telegraphy and um, six months later I was what to call on the extra board. Here you go here for a day or a week or a month or and you go here for who knows how long back and forth and that's how I met my wife because uh, they had sent me to her hometown and I worked from midnight until 8 in the morning. Uh, then I asked Reverend Telegrapher and station agent and in the date mornings I'd go up to the local pool hall after I got off work and there's always one or two or four or five high school boys there. We'd go hunting and uh, And it was, it was very pleasant. How did you propose to your wife? Well, first, I first met her by going into, you know, that's not right. I first saw her when one of her classmates and I had gone, been hunting and went to Greasy Spoon for, for lunch. And her and her girlfriend was in there. And I told this boy. That's the prettiest girl in school. And uh, they all got through about the same time, so he caught up with them and told her. <laughs> well, I, I went to basketball games and stuff, and she played basketball. So after the game she was in, she came and sat down in front of me. Hmm. Happened to have a seat. And uh, we got talking. 
and I dated her then, and uh, it was a long drive after after that. And I, how did I propose to her? We was out one night. I simply said, told her that I belonged to the Episcopal Church, and if she expected to marry me, she'd have to join the church. <laughs> Very romantic. Very romantic, and she did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talk about a little bit after your marriage. Um, you were still involved in the military during that time? Well, I was in the active reserves. Okay. Or I went to a meeting every, every, I think it was every Monday night. But anyway, um, then I got recalled for, for Korea as it started. We got married in March of 50 and June of 50. Hmm. Korea started. Wow. And uh, I happened to be on a reserve cruise. So I went back home which I didn't expect to do. Uh, I got orders sending me out to San Diego. Hmm. And uh, there I, I spent 13 months in San Diego recommissioning a bunch of ships that I had helped decommission hmm. in 46. And uh, our first child was born out there. Did she live on base with you? Uh, oh, I didn't live on base. Oh, okay. Uh, only officers could live on base in the Navy. And uh, we lived in Chula Vista, hmm. which was south of San Diego. Okay. And, uh, oh, I don't know where to go. <laughs> so, during this time, the Cold War era, Korean War, can you talk a little bit about what it was like during the Cold War, some of the tensions, some of the fears? Well, see, I didn't, I didn't see any of them. Huh. I never felt any of it. Wow. Um, during the Second World War, we had rationing, which didn't bother me any. Uh, gasoline, I could... I had a farmer give me his, his ration cards, so, so I had all the gasoline I needed. Hmm. Um, and there just wasn't any any pressure. To me, I didn't feel any pressure anywhere. Wow, interesting. So, and you remained in the reserves up until the Vietnam War era? Is no. Is that correct? No. Uh, after I got out, in 51, um, I was out. Oh, okay. And I, I worked for Roar Aircraft Corporation. They wanted me to go into Bakersfield, California uh, and as supervisor of this section. And uh, I talked to too many retired military working there. And uh, I decided that I was going to go back in the military. Hmm. And I thought I would go into the Air Force because they're land-based. I figured I would be home most of the time, but that wasn't true. I was still gone half the time. <laughs> now, while you were talking to these other veterans, was that uh, in hopes of economic prosperity or patriotic duty? What well, were some of the reasons? Just, um, I was just seeing how they was feeling about things. And they definitely, they were mostly retired. Mm. And they recommended highly that I go back in the military and retire. Oh, okay. Which I did. Okay. So, talk a little bit about uh, training with the Air Force. <laughs> Benz, I'd been in the Navy. They didn't think I needed any training. So they 
sent me right to active duty at Omaha, Nebraska, SAC headquarters as an electrician. What were some of your duties during that time? Well, changing light bulbs, and, uh, hooking up different circuits, electrical circuits and stuff, okay. up at headquarters. Uh, then I got transferred to England in 40, 44 and 45. In 54? In 54 and 55, yeah. Okay. And uh, I was one of three sergeants that was sent up to this base at called East Kirkby up in Lincolnshire. That we were sent up there as the advanced advanced party, make sure everything was ready for the wing to come up there from down at Bargate, hmm. down in Kent. And I happened to hear that they were taking this mansion and turning it into um, apartments. Hmm. So I jumped on the bandwagon and went out there and uh, talked to them and I got the first apartment, which happened to be the quarters of the title lady. Had, sure. had lived in. Wow. And uh, it was an interesting stay. My wife and I both thoroughly enjoyed it uh, when she got over there. And um, I associated with the English. Uh, the English people are lost. That's the best way I can say it. <laughs> if you walk up to an Englishman and try to strike a conversation, chances are you won't get a reply in the answer question you ask. <laughs> uh, I saw it happen too many times, but I was accepted by them, hmm. as I didn't tear them down. Too many GIs get out there particularly, and uh, they start berating the English systems. Mm. Uh, I found them very enjoyable. And I was given a job <coughs> which nobody knew anything about. <laughs> and uh, I was given five Englishmen uh, to rebuild the base, uh, preventive maintenance. So, uh, I had no idea what to do or anything else. That's the reason I got it, because nobody knew. And uh, I happened to be talking to this lieutenant uh, one night. Noticed on, on his desk he had some manuals. One of them was ROTC manual on preventing maintenance. So I borrowed the book. And I set the whole system up, and it worked wonderfully. Because I had no idea how to log some things in, like we have a door that's half off, and it had to reattach the screw of uh, the uh, hinges. How do you write that up? So I put down rehang door, and we did in 30 days. We did 3,000 jobs. Wow. Little jobs like that. Mm. And I could go to the Air Ministry and order anything I needed instead of going through the military. And uh, I ordered a case of glass, window glass. And my order went in and it went to London. And it went south of London, then it went way north in England, and here came my glass. Three days. I could depend on it. They, I had wonderful setup. But anyway, 
it turns out that it was an experiment to see if an American sergeant could work five Englishmen. And because I didn't mistreat, uh, mistreat them, I didn't stop their having their tea breaks and stuff. And every once in a while we went to the local pubs. What do you think about pub food? Hmm? What do you think about pub food? Pub food? I never had any food in pub. No? <laughs> no. I always had drinks. L's? Always drinks. Did you like, drink a lot of L during that time? Oh, no. Uh, I was a scotch drinker. Oh, okay. But I was... Uh, the title lady had maintained the right to hold dances in the ballroom downstairs. Huh. And uh, I was at one of those dances and went upstairs to check my fireplaces. And while I was getting wood, the uh, chauffeur for the title lady uh, was up in the hall and asked me if I minded if the title lady's daughter and son came up and saw what they had done to the, the, the area. I welcomed. So they came up, and at around 10 o'clock, Three o'clock in the morning, they finally leave. <laughs> we had a very enjoyable conversation. Uh, she was the daughter, uh, daughter, the uh, wife of a doctor in London, and her brother Michael was had been a big game hunter in Africa for the government, huh. and. Uh, It was very interesting that because I was then accepted by the well-to-do in the area. Huh. And uh, we always went to formal dances. We was invited to all sorts of affairs, hmm. and it was fun. I bet. And uh, uh, I always have to tell the story that the title lady was the main character in a book that was written by H.D. Lawrence. Oh, oh, Lady Chatterley's Lovers. And uh, it banned for quite a, while, quite a few years in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> she was quite a young lady. Yeah. And uh, but it was she was wonderful to talk with. Um, and I just I thoroughly enjoyed chatting with her. In fact, we was at a party one night, and she came up and says, "I understand you have an apartment where my quarters were." I says, "Yes, I do." She said, "Well, have you been out in the park?" I said, yeah. Have you been out in any of the summer houses? I said, yeah. She said, oh, I have had so much fun out there. Didn't we, Sid? Sid was one of the farmers on her property. And his face turned just bright red. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> It was, <clears throat> it was a wonderful time, and it's changed a lot. The title lady died. Uh, that year, we left there in 55, and she died later, late in the year. And her daughter, who was up in, in our apartment, took over for about three years, and she died. And uh, now the estate house is no longer uh, open for anything. Mm -hmm. and, but there's a lot of change over there. So where did you go after uh, Kent? After after we left England there, went to uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. 
better known Springfield area okay. and to an Air Force base. <coughs> I can't remember the name of it offhand. But um, from there I went to Tudley Greenland, left my family there. I spent a year up in Greenland, came back, and working there for a while, and then they sent me and another sergeant up to Maine on a special project <coughs> of strobe lighting for their airfield. And then they were bringing in uh, planes from all different branches of service to come in on that. And one Marine pilot dropped in and flash hit him. He went right back up. And he wasn't coming back into that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after that, then I went back to Springfield. And from there, then. I went to, to uh, White Bend Air Force Base, Missouri, at Novnoster. Yeah. Most people call it Sedalia, which is 650 miles away. But uh, stayed there for several years, and then they put me into uh, tech school to be a, 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 in Shepherd Air Force Base to be an instructor on electricity. Okay. And I did that for a couple of years, and then they needed munitions experts. So they sent me to Lowry Air Force Base at Denver to uh, tech school. I had taught the basic electricity for a while, and then they had sent me up there to learn munitions. And um, from there then I went to as an instructor. I taught there for a while. Then they sent me to Vietnam. What year did you go to Vietnam? Uh, bomb loader. What year did you go to oh. Vietnam? Uh, 66, 67. So early on. And uh, our only problem we had was our trucks going to the flight line. There was a, we had to go past the village, and there was a, an expert marksman. He was so good, he never hit anybody, but he shot at our trucks. And bullets came, came close enough, they knew they'd been shot at. Mm. So, back to came to the munition dump, mm. and that stopped all the flow of munitions to the flight line. Mm. And, go ahead. To back up a little bit, do you remember whenever Kennedy was assassinated? Yes. I was in Berkman at Texas. What were your thoughts? Uh, well, I thought, means I went to church. We had special services and stuff for him, for prayers, and uh, healing of the family and stuff. And uh, we were in a small mission there in Burke Burnett, which physically uh, we, we had a building built as 100 by 60 feet. And uh, myself and another sergeant uh, did all the electrical wiring in it. And uh, it was an, a real pleasant place to, to be. Burkinet was, was very pleasant. Okay. And during this time throughout your military career, you wit witnessed some great changes to the military service, such as the integration of troops. Do you care, the, the integration yeah. of the military, do you care to comment on that at all? Any experiences with that? Well, I didn't have any trouble with it, really. Uh, I, I will say I am partial. 
and about things. Um, I had at Whiteman Air Force Base, I had 10 young airmen working for me. And every Wednesday afternoon we'd have a class for a couple hours. And we had one black boy in it. And I knew from talking with him and so he did not understand a negative question. So I made sure I had a 10, 10 question test I gave him after each, each session. And I always put a negative question in hmm. just so he would miss one. Hmm. <laughs> and you know, that's not nice, but that's what I did. Hmm. Um, I have had some very good friends uh, that were black. Uh, in the in the service, and uh, race actually doesn't bother me. That's good enough. Picking back up, and uh, we were talking about your path to Vietnam. Um, how, when did you become aware that you would be deployed to Vietnam? Well, and. Early '66. And did uh, you and your your family talk before your deployment? Not much. Not much. And uh, I just accepted things. Okay. And uh, tell me where you went from. Uh, I'm assuming you left from California. No. No. I left from Denver and went to Miami, Florida, oh. and. Joined a group, and from Florida we flew to Alaska, Alaska to Japan, Japan to Vietnam. Was it a commercial airliner? Commercial airliner. Okay. What were your impressions as soon as you got off the plane in Vietnam? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to say that. Um, Do you remember your first day there at all? Not really. Uh, you know, lived in a tent, and uh, four of us sergeants in a tent, and uh, prepared bombs for. To load on airplanes, and uh, my first first night there, uh, we had the army bringing dump trucks with uh, three pallets of uh, bombs, several thousand pounds of bombs on a pallet, and. Uh, had no way to get the third pallet up, so I had them. I cleared the revetment and had forklift driver come up behind the pickup, uh, behind the dump truck, with his forks down about a foot below the back of the truck, yeah. and had the driver dump. It. Slid down on the forklift. <laughs> That's the only way. The next day, they had changed to, to help pull those out. Okay. But these army guys, I don't know how far they drive these dump trucks with these thousands of pounds of bombs on them mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to get over the hills and get to us. Mm -hmm. But we were at a Wonderful base. It's right on the ocean, and um, in fact, our runway took off over the ocean. Hmm. And in the summertime, you couldn't ask for a more beautiful place to be. And hmm. um, uh, wintertime, you didn't get near that ocean. It was rough. <laughs> and uh, 
Sometimes our planes taking off had to get up before the waves got them. Wow. But they, it worked. And um, when I got my orders, I told people I was going to Toy Hoy. And I found out that wasn't until tell people that. But anyway, that was Toy Hoy is not the name of it. Toy Wa. <laughs> hmm. And it was it was a nice nice overall base. Hmm. And what can I say? What did you guys do to pass the time while you weren't working on base? Yeah, I played cards. Mostly not gambling, but just just cards. Um, Cribbage and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, how did the food compare? <laughs> well, we, we got over there in November, just before Thanksgiving. And I believe I had the best Thanksgiving dinner. I had ever had in the military. <laughs> and it was all cooked on ranges outside. Hmm. And uh, delicious. And you, know, you had trouble getting salt out of a shaker. And, and uh, your sugar had bugs in it. <laughs> and you just had to be careful how you, how you ate. Pick those bugs out. Well, if you pick too many of them out, didn't have any sugar left. <laughs> but it was it was interesting. Okay. Was there ever any danger of the base being infiltrated? We had rock troops. I don't know what rock is. It's the Republic of Korea mm. troops on our perimeter of our base wow. with machine guns. And uh, then out away from the base, for 30 days we'd have the 101st Division out there moving around, trying to find enemy. And then the next 30 days we'd have the 176th Division. Yeah. And uh, they traded off. and. Uh, uh, other than snipers shooting at, at our truck drivers, uh, uh, we didn't have any problems. And in fact, my last day there, I went to supply to shake hands with my rifle because I hadn't seen it for a year. Hmm. And I wished I hadn't. I hadn't even taken them out of Cosmo. <laughs> if we had ever been attacked, they just wouldn't have, people wouldn't have had guns, right. but we weren't, so. Well, the 101st was a fairly elite division. That's the 101st Airborne, yeah. Yeah, and then the South Koreans, they were battle-hardened veterans as well. Yeah. Um, did you ever interact with any of those guys? Well, no. Um, Actually, we never saw the 101st or 176th. Yeah. Um, we just knew they was there. And I got ready to go on R&R &R to Hong Kong mm -hmm. from there. And I was waiting for my airplane. There was a six by truck came up. Had a bunch of Koreans on it. Not Koreans, what was it? Vietnamese on it. And they were all blindfolded. And arms tied behind their backs. And when I got to Hong Kong, I read in the newspaper, they had been a bunch that had been discovered in some caves and tunnels. Mm -hmm. And these were the survivors. Huh. And uh, they had bring them there to take them off someplace to, or, I guess, uh, find out what they knew. Mm -hmm. 
and the uh, but these these were the survivors of that, and that in the hundred and first had got them. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, nothing. Was there ever any interaction with civilian populations during your time in Vietnam? Well, some. We could go into town any time we had a day off. And uh, I had two, two work for me. Uh, they put me for a while into uh, safety. And I uh, had a man and a woman work for me there, and then had my maid that uh, after I was there for a little while, you know, we'd have these B 52s flying by and dropping bombs on the hills around us hmm. and uh, knock us out of bed. But anyway, they moved me as a tech sergeant into a building that had been used by the civilian contractors. Mm. So there was two of us to a room and uh, nice quarters. And uh, there we had a maid, so. Okay. What, what were your impressions of the standard of living for the Vietnamese? Well, to them it was good. But to me, it definitely wasn't. Um, there's really no sanitation. Um, your bathroom was a slit in the floor. And uh, they always had pigs and stuff un pinned up underneath their houses. It was on stilts, most of them. And, uh, Uh, there was a beetle that was about six, eight inches long, <laughs> I forget what they were called, and they would catch them and they'd smell them. And if they smelt right, they ate them. Wow. And uh, you could sell them, all those you could catch, you could sell them for a nickel apiece. Wow. But, uh, um, their standards of living just was so low. Um, was there ever any lack of trust between what you experienced with the military and the civilians? No. No, we didn't have any problems with them. Well, you mentioned the Beatles. Uh, did you try any of the local cuisine at all? Uh, not in Vietnam. No. Um, primarily, you didn't dare. <laughs> uh, for instance, if you bought a Coca-Cola in town, you might not live through it. Wow. They had a habit of putting acid in. Hmm. And many times, you'd get these bottles of Coke and stuff and lids were rusting off hmm. because they had acid in them. Wow. You know, you just never knew. Hmm. So, um, I didn't, I didn't partake. I went in town two or three times is all. Hmm. Um, you mentioned the R&R &R in Hong Kong. Did your, did your wife meet with you? Oh, no. No? No, uh, it was only three days hmm. and, uh, so she stayed, she stayed in Ponca City. Well, what did you do during your time in Hong Kong? Bought clothes. Bought clothes and <clears throat> another guy and I <clears throat> uh, took a taxi, taxi ride all around that area. Spent a whole day out huh. and uh, went over to China border and and uh, the gateway between China and Hong Kong area. Hmm. And uh, had a very, very, that, now that was 
Yeah, that's in Hong Kong, yeah. Very pleasant. I enjoyed Hong Kong. Uh, their standards were considerably higher than the uh, Vietnamese. Hmm. How long were you in Vietnam? One year. Okay. And during that time, were you exposed to Agent Orange? Yeah. Now, I didn't know it because all the trees in that area had leaves. Hmm. And Agent Orange was supposed to get rid of them. I didn't find out I was contaminated till I got here. And what effects have you had due to your exposure? Well, my diabetes, of course, and the uh, uh, a lot of my instability in my legs, uh, my heart problems. And do you receive benefits for those? Yes. Okay. I'm, um, <clears throat> they say I'm 70% disabled, but because I am unable to work, I'm receiving 100% benefits. How did you go about the process of getting those benefits? How long did it take? It was extremely easy. Hmm. In fact, I fell into it. Wow. Uh, that's the only way I can say it. Um, I went down to, at the time, there was a um, VA representative from the state of Oklahoma. Hmm. Every Tuesday came into the American Legion post here. Hmm. And I went in and talked to him one Tuesday. <coughs> And he gave me a form to fill out. So I took it home. Next Tuesday, I took it back to him. He looked at it and said, oh, you were in Vietnam. I said, yeah. Well, here, we got another form to fill out. I went in there basically to see about hearing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he filled out, he filled, he filled out the other form. Only government employee I know that love fill out forms. <laughs> Um, next thing I knew, I got a call from the VA. They wanted me to go over the following Thursday to Tulsa and see three doctors. Hmm. And uh, that went on for five weeks. Hmm. And I, uh, they would check with me and how I was treated and everything, and, and respectful and this. And I had to tell them one that the uh, doctor uh, wasn't very respectful at all. Mm. And so they sent me down to Edmond to a doctor. Well, next thing I knew, I, I got a letter. Because of my hearing, I was 30% disabled. Mm. And uh, a few months later, I got another letter saying that I uh, had been raised to 60. A month later, I got another one sent it raised to 70. Mm -hmm. Got a letter from the state of Oklahoma saying I was 100%. Mm -hmm. And it just, everything just fell in place. What time frame was this? In the overall picture, uh, I don't think it was six months. I mean, I mean as far as a year. Like, what time of your life was this, the the year? Oh. You know, to be honest with you, I don't really remember. Hmm. Uh, but it had to be... Had to be in the 80s. Okay. And was your hearing, uh, was that damaged from your military service? Uh... I think so. Okay. And you said you were in Vietnam for a year. Whenever you got home, um, take us through your reintegration into the States. Well, when I came back to the States, family lived in Ponca City. <coughs> and 
uh, the incising munitions, which knew I was going to go right back over. So I didn't take my family up to South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota, mm -hmm. with me. And I didn't see any sense in moving them all the way up there and then whatever. And so they stayed in punk. And I versed back and forth. And then uh, I got orders for Thailand. And um, I went over in Thailand in January. Uh, 69 yeah. and um, came back in January of 70 and reported to Vance Air Force Base for retirement yeah. and on uh, they started Master Sergeant started telling me what I was going to be doing and I said no Sergeant I'm here to retire. I'm not here to work. Oh, <laughs> so I said, when you get all the paperwork done, give me a call and I'll come over and take care of things. Hmm. So uh, February the 1st, I went over and took all my papers. What were your impressions of some of the anti-war demonstrations during that time? Well, I can see a lot of the people's thinking. And um, being as I was on active duty and everything, uh, I still couldn't fault them. That was their ideas. Mm -hmm. But my idea, I was doing my job. Right. And. That makes a difference. Did you ever experience any uh, events in which uh, you experienced these anti-war demonstrations personally? No. No. I had a captain friend that was here for a number of years and uh, he's been in the American Legion. When he came back, he got off the airplane in California, and he got spit on, uh -huh. which that kind of bothered me. Too. And throughout your 25 years of service in the military, uh, what was difficult as far as family life or social life? The social life was never, never difficult. I'm not really go out, go out mm -hmm. and do things, and never have been. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I just get to go with the flow. <laughs> Were you involved in uh, military-related organizations afterwards? No, excepting for. Uh, American Legion, yeah, and past commander of post-127, 129, and uh, I belong to Perkins VFW, and I'm a member of the disabled American veterans. And you had five children, right? Mm -hmm. And well, I have four now. You have four now. Um, did your military service ever, was it hard being away from your children during this time? Uh, yeah. Of yeah. course, right? Yeah. Um, they did good, though. And um, somehow they managed. <laughs> of course, I had a wife who was one of these from a poor family, farmers, and six kids, and uh, she was able to cook and prepare meals for them at a nominal cost. So my military pay 
stretched. Absolutely. So you provided for your family while yeah. you were in there. Um, so talk a little bit about Oklahoma. You've, you've been in Oklahoma for going on 40 well, years. We moved here in April of 72. And we have thoroughly enjoyed living here. It's the only house we've had since came to Oklahoma to this part. Uh, and uh, we've always been able to, oh, we used to shoot skeet out over this field north of us. And uh, boys and I did a lot of hunting and we go around locally, different places and hunt and fish. Um, when we back in the uh, in late 60s and 70s, uh, we lived in Ponk City, or they did, and uh, we'd go fishing when I was home. All sorts of things like that. And just had a lot of fun. Okay. And uh, did you, any of your children go to Stillwater High or OSU? Uh, none of them went to OSU. Uh, my oldest daughter and oldest son were out of, out of high school. Uh, my youngest daughter was out of high school. Okay. So my two youngest sons went to Pleasant View, which was up here, and uh, then they went to the high school. Okay. And did any of your children follow in your footsteps to the military? One. My oldest son, retired tech, uh, tech sergeant, and he was a black box changer. And uh, stationed primarily at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Hmm. <clears throat> and was uh, involved with making modifications on the B-1 and B-2 B bomber. Hmm. And uh, working with the engineers. And he had, he had a pretty good job. Interesting one, but he's the only one. Then my youngest son got electrocuted. His electrician, and he got a hold of the wrong thing, and high voltage, and he shouldn't have got a hold of it. But it looked to him like it was dead, and it wasn't. Taken from the wrong direction, and then his next older brother has Sanders Electric here in town, and he's doing real good as electrician. A lot of times, people need something done; they'll give him a call. He may have to put them off for two or three weeks. <laughs> He's busy. And he's busy, and and they'll wait for him. They know, know how the quality of work he does. And then my youngest daughter has an accounting firm in uh, Austin, Texas. And my oldest daughter is retired. She was working when she retired with the. Uh, Veterans Administration Hospital in Lakeview, Lake City, Florida. Well, Mr. Sanders, you've experienced a great deal of change throughout your life. Uh, yes. You're part of what's been described as the greatest generation. What are some of the greatest changes that you've experienced in your life? <laughs> Everything. Wow. <laughs> uh, television, cell phones, um, oh, geez, it's unlimited changes that you've gone through, and 
changes that are coming in. And we're in the very beginning of them. And the question is, where will they end? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're a ver veteran of three foreign wars. Mm -hmm. And what, what role does government and society need to take when it's concerned with its veterans? for the current veterans of the Iraq wars and Afghanistan? Well, the Veterans Administration need to be more orientated to treating their problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said a while ago, I'm very fortunate I fell into everything for me. And uh, I've taken 10 gentlemen now down to uh, Midwest City to the Disabled American Veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, nine of them have received benefits by going down there. Wow. And I haven't talked to the last one whether or not he didn't have his papers. So they had to send to Kansas City and get them. And I haven't heard from him if he's heard anything from them, or he want, needs to get, well, he was in Vietnam, so he needs to get Agent Orange, so. Well, throughout your 25 years of service? Well, actually 20. 20, 20 years of service. Um, how has your military service shaped your philosophical views or your political views on life or in society in general? The military, since I went in in 45, <coughs> has completely changed. Um, in the 60s, it had gotten to a point where there's a lot of play on words. And uh, you had to watch, if you supervisor, had to watch what you said. But I understand now it has gone way past that. Uh, if you tell an enlisted man to do something, you don't have to and get away with it. It wasn't that way when I was in. And but I understand that's that's the way it's gone now. Um, when I when I was in there um, I had situations where I I would giving uh, people special training and they called it punishment. So I never, never once said it was punishment because it wasn't. It was special training. Besides that, I couldn't give them punishment. <laughs> um, I stood on my two feet, uh, had a young man that needed some special training, and he went in to see a super sergeant about that he thought it was punishment. So the super sergeant called me in, we had to talk. He informed me that that man didn't have to do what I said. So I, my return was, sergeant, are you in charge of that man? He said, no, you are. I said, okay, keep out. Mm -hmm. And subject was dropped. And the man got a special training. <laughs> but, Again, you just had to watch what you said and how you said it. And uh, as long as you derated somebody in a uh, nice manner, you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Sanders, uh, throughout this interview, has there been anything that you wanted to discuss throughout your life that I haven't asked or hasn't came up yet? I don't think so. Well, um, I have one final question. 
Uh, what would you like to be remembered for? Being a good father. That's about it. All right. <laughs> well, um, I'd like to thank you for your dedication and your service to your country. And I'd like to thank you for sharing your story. Right. Yeah, I hope it fills some of your spaces. Thank you. Wasn't a bunch of glory, but it was interesting. Thank you.